Well, our guest today is a name that comes to mind in many, many, many households in Manitoba, a household name, and that would be John Harvard, who was for roughly 30 years an outstanding broadcast journalist for both private and public networks, and who served for 16 years as a member of parliament for Winnipeg St. James, as it was called when he was elected. And he also served as the 23rd Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba. Hello, John. Hello, Leslie. Nice to talk to you. Just for, for starters, uh, your early life is really interesting. You were a country kid. Uh, I, I understand 11th of 14 children, which is almost unheard of now. And you come from a strong cultural heritage. And, and this, this little guy ended up not just meeting the Queen, but in fact being her chief representative in Manitoba. How did that early life prepare you for the one that came later? Well, uh, that may not be easy to answer, but I can remember, I can remember my, my mother, particularly my mother was a strong monarchist. And I can remember the day that the King died, which of course at that time, Queen Elizabeth, who now has been on the throne longer than anyone, longer than Victoria, um, she was what, only 25, I think, when she became queen. And I can remember I was lying in bed and my mother, my mother came into the bedroom, it was early morning, and, and she said, uh, the king is dead. And she was so forlorn and, and so down because, you know, the king had died at, at an early age. So I, I grew up in a family that, uh, that was monarchist. Uh, but in, a, in addition to that, you know, we, we were, as you say, a, a large family. I was number 11. Uh, there were 14 births, but only 12 of the 14, you know, lived to adulthood. And uh, we were tightly knit, um, a farm family, uh, you know, 100 miles, you know, west of Winnipeg. And uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I just think it was the kind of milieu, uh, the kind of culture that I, was, that I was involved in that prepared me for, you know, my life of not only to be a journalist, but to be a parliamentarian and ultimately to be the left-handed governor of, uh, of the province. So I think I had a good start. Did, did the fact that you had this, this strong Icelandic connection make any difference? Oh, I, I, I think so. Um, I, you know, the Icelandic community is small in relative terms. I mean, compared to the French community and, and some other communities, it's, it's very small. So I guess in a way to be, you know, to survive, you have to, you have to cohere, you have to be, you know, closely knit. And, and the Icelanders were. Um, and remember, there were sort of two large settlements of Icelanders in, in, in Manitoba. There was the one in Gimli, which was the, the better known of the two, uh, two communities. But uh, because my family grew up in an agricultural setting in, in Iceland, my family didn't come to, to Lake Winnipeg or Lake Manitoba. We came to an agricultural setting, setting Glenbro, Balder, Grund, uh, that, that was the area about 100 miles west of, uh, of Winnipeg. So it, it was natural. And, you know, back in those days, most Icelandic families spoke Icelandic. You know, when I was, when I was four years old, um, I didn't speak any English. I spoke only, uh, uh, only Icelandic. But I think my parents made a terrible mistake. You know, they really felt that it was a burden to, uh, you know, to saddle me and the other children with only the one language. So they made a point of getting us to speak English. And you know how children are, Leslie. After a while, you know, that's the dominant main language. And so we all spoke English and we abandoned Icelandic. And I, I, uh, I regret that. Well, you certainly made good use of your English because <laughs> it saw you through a 30-year career in broadcasting. And uh, in, in that time, I think ACTRA, the Association of Canadian Television and Radio Artists, named you the best man in radio in 1976, right? The winner this year for Best Public Affairs Broadcaster in Television is John Harvard for 24 Hours. <laughs> Your 
beautiful Nellie, but I promise never to seduce you. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank uh, the Association of Canadian Television and Radio Artists. I think this award tonight recognizes the finest public affairs television program in this country. Radio and television, 1960, 1976. Uh, and I was between Patrick Watson and Adrian Clarkson. So it doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, 1976. How did broadcasting prepare you for, for politics? Because it's so common to go into politics from law or business. You know what? I think that journalism is probably the greatest liberal arts education you can get because you are exposed to so many, so many issues. And I've often, and I've often thought that uh, uh, I, I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't get to university, but I, but I did get into, into journalism early. You know, I was only, uh, you know, 20 years of age and I was exposed to so many different issues. And, and you, you learn, you know, you learn on your feet as it were. And I, I was very, very fortunate. And uh, I, I think, as I say, I think it was the best liberal arts education I could get. Now, you have to take it seriously. I mean, if you, you know, if you just uh, take it as a bit of a lark, uh, you're not going to learn. But I, I was lucky, for some reason, I took it seriously. And uh, it served me extremely well. Now, I know that you interviewed many, many influential politicians mm -hmm. during your career as, as a broadcast journalist. I think you interviewed Diefenbaker, Pearson, oh, yes. former Premier of Manitoba, Duff Roblin. Can you remember who made an impression on you back in those days? Most of them were, were, were outstanding. I, I mean, for example, I thought Robert Stanfield, you know, some people refer to him as the best prime minister that Canada never had. I thought he was a great man, uh, and I think it was, I think it was the kind of values he had. I don't think it's having to do, uh, often with uh, say just party policy and you know the way one conducts himself. It has to do with values, you know what you stand for. And I got the sense that that, that Robert Stanfield was uh, was a man of, of of high values, who really believed in in uh, in serving the public and serving the country. And of course. What else? But, but uh, when it comes to politics, that's what it's about, you know. If you if you if you want to serve your country, serve your country directly, politics is an avenue. It's not the only one, but it's it's a great avenue if you take it seriously. Now, it, it was quite natural that you would be approached, given that you were already uh, a celebrity, that you would be approached to go into politics. But I'm curious to know why you would accept that challenge, given that you were secure in your job, you were satisfied in your job, and we all know that the life of a politician is not an easy one. What made you say yes? <laughs> well, it's, it, it is a good question. I think you have to be, uh, I think you have to be, uh, a little bit daring or, or a little bit crazy. You know what, I, I was a student council president in high school for, for two years in grades 11 and, and grade uh, 12. And uh, so in, in a way I was, I was a bit snake bitten by politics, if you can call it that, in, in high school. But of course, having gone into, uh, uh, into journalism, there was no way that the, you, the two could uh, come together. And so I just simply put politics uh, on the back burner, as it were, and it was on the back burner for, for more than 30 years. But finally, at age 50, and I was a little bit more financially stable, although I've often wondered that if I hadn't won that first election of mine, what would have happened? Um, I don't want to think about it because it's not something nice to think about. But anyway, at age 50, with a little bit of financial stability, uh, and I was getting a little tired of... Uh, of the CBC, that's not a knock against the CBC, but you know, after you've been there for quite a while, you you look for greener pastures or something that looks greener, and I decided to take the the plunge, and fortunately, I I won the first election, and and three three after that, I think sometimes I've often wondered, Leslie, that if that if I'd known what I was getting into the first time around. I probably w wouldn't have uh, sought, you know, a public office. But so, in some ways, it's it's good that you don't you don't know everything that you're that you're getting into. But I'm I'm glad I did. It's uh, you, you know, politicians uh, come under attack every day, but it is an honorable profession. It has to be an honorable profession. 
I mean, who's, I mean, organizing a country, leading a country, giving it stewardship um, is simply just one of the most important functions, you know, in, in public life. Now, th this is a, an ongoing question, but I'll ask it anyway. Does a member of parliament have any real power? Real power. Real power. I guess it depends on how you define real. Uh, not a hell of a lot. Not a lot. Um, you're part of a collective. You're part of a uh, of a large group. You're, uh, you know, you you can make your voice heard, but how do you, but how how, how do you measure that? You know, uh, every Wednesday morning, uh, party caucuses of parties meet, and so you know, like when I was there, I was uh, before. Uh, before we went into government, or after we went into government, we had a caucus of 150, 160, 170. So you're one voice. You're one voice um, of that of that group. So it can be heard, but when it's measured against all the other voices, I don't know how. You know how do I define it, or how do I measure it? It's 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 not easy. One of the things, though, uh, that I did is I I, I made it a point. To, um, to become chairman of, of various caucuses because uh, caucuses are, are broken down. There's the Manitoba caucus, there's the Western caucus, there's the national caucus, right? And so, uh, and, I, and I chaired all three caucuses over the 16 years. And so you can, you know, as a chairperson, you can uh, put your own spin on issues. Uh, and, that, and so that gives you a little bit of additional power that somebody else doesn't have because you know they will, you know, in a private meeting, a private caucus meeting, they'll make their contribution, but ultimately that contribution is then defined and spun out, as it were, by you know by the chairman of the caucus. So um, there is that to it. So any any little way you can add to your voice, so much the better. But on top of of uh, the expectations for you to contribute. Uh, in Ottawa, you of course had duties back at home. Oh yes. What what did your constituents expect from you? What does it describe <laughs> the community you represent? Well, you know that's a good question because I think constituents, God bless their souls, um, they very often expect the impossible. They they want you to be in both places at the same time. Uh, they want you to be in Ottawa, and they want you to be in in, in Winnipeg if you're an MP for Winnipeg, and. Uh, and so it's 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 very difficult, you know, to to serve everybody. But um, uh, when you're at home, uh, and w it puts a lot of pressure on families because um, I think that's why I don't know what the the divorce rate is in is in in politics, but I suspect it's it's pretty high. High because even when you're at home, like I I can remember in my situation, you generally always four days a week in Ottawa. So you come home, but uh, you know local people—they've planned many things for you. There are foul suppers, and there are meetings of, of of different kinds. And even if there isn't an election campaign on, how do you meet people? You know, you have to go out and door knock. And uh, and I was the kind of you know I was the kind of politician. It didn't matter when it was in the year, you know, whether it was a cold January day or a hot July day. I was out door knocking because. You have to be, you have to expose yourself to, you know, to the people. Uh, uh, I can remember Herb Gray, the late Herb Gray, uh, who served in Parliament for 39 years. And Herb said, if you're not seen and if you're not heard, they assume that you're not doing anything. And I think Herb was right. And Herb, and I can remember Herb once saying uh, that, uh, he would go down and he, he would go down and pick up the mail in Ottawa uh, at seven o'clock in the morning, and and one of his you know one of his colleagues said, Herb, you know you've already been in in the house for several decades. What are you doing picking up the mail at seven o'clock? He says, Well, that's part of being of the job. If if I don't go out and at seven o'clock in the morning and pick up the mail, they assume that I'm probably sleeping in and doing nothing. So that was you know one of his secrets to uh, to success. And, and, you know, the other thing is, um, and this came a little easier for me, you never, you never uh, miss an interview. 
You know, if the television station calls, you come. If radio calls, you come. If a newspaper calls, you come. It's all part of establishing that relationship with, with constituents. It's very important. Now, you worked very closely for quite a long time with one of the most colorful and influential prime minister the country has ever had. That, of course, is uh, Jean Chrétien. What did you learn about politics from that association? I think the thing that I learned about uh, uh, Chrétien was uh, you can, even when you're holding high office, and he held the highest you know, political office you can t attain uh, being prime minister, you can be comfortable in your own skin if you, if you approach the issues properly. And uh, I found Chrétien extraordinary in that regard. Uh, making decisions for him uh, was easy, was very easy. Uh, I often thought that if you found Chrétien hesitating, there was a reason for it. You know, that the issue had not ripened. It was just simply not time to make the decision. The decision may come a week from, from then or two weeks or a month or whatever. But uh, making a decision, uh, he wasn't worried about his worry about uh, somehow it was going to come back and, and, and bite him because he felt that uh, uh, decision making as a prime minister was one of the main functions of the office. So just simply go ahead and do it. The other thing about, uh, about Chrétien, he did not get wrapped up in, in a lot of issues. Um, he, was, um, he was crazy about the charter and he was crazy about universal health care. Everything else was just a management issue. You know, I think there are a lot of people, they get, they get caught up in, well, there are just so many issues. It could be child care, it could be human rights. There are just so many things. And they may not even sleep overnight because of it. Chrétien was not that way. There were the only two issues where I always sensed that he, it really caught him, and that was universal health care and the Charter of, of Rights. And it, he felt so strongly about those two issues. So I think it gave him a sort of a longer political life. Uh, and that's why he was so comfortable in his own skin. So if you look back at, at those 16 years, what is it possible to say what the highlight of your work in politics was? Highlight? Well, you know what? I think I had many highlights. Uh, but if you want to ask me um, uh, a particular highlight that, uh, that still shines through, it has to do with uh, uh, same-sex marriage. The interesting thing for me when it comes to same-sex marriage, I wasn't there for the final vote, you know, the, the vote. That, that made it legal. I was there for the earlier votes because I left, I left Parliament in 2004 and the, ultimately the, the, the final vote that made it legal didn't happen until a year later. But I was involved in a number of, uh, of the issues leading up to the final vote. And so um, I'm still very much, you know, I was still very much involved in the issue. But the reason why I feel, feel so strongly that way, Leslie, is because homosexuals, you know, gays and lesbians, we're such a persecuted uh, minority all around the world for centuries and centuries and centuries. And to see them achieve this kind of freedom, uh, this kind of respect, it's, I mean, to be on the winning side, it, it really, really is, is, is gratifying. I was happy for them. And you know what? It happened a lot quicker than we thought. In fact, I recall it was probably about, uh, Oh, maybe uh, well, four years earlier, um, we had a vote with respect to uh, uh, human rights, right? Having to do with gays and lesbians. And the Reform Party, it was still extant back in those days, w threw in sort of a, a mischievous uh, motion asking us to support uh, marriage as a, you know, an institution involving only men and, and women, not, not same sex. And we thought, we liberals thought, oh, uh, we could support that because that's not going to change for, you know, 10 or 15 years. So we, we supported that motion, thinking there was, it was not going to really mean much anyway. Well, would you believe it was like within a year, suddenly the issue hit the courts. And it was, you know, the issue was overturned in British Columbia. It was overturned in, in, in Ontario. 
And the government of the day, that was our government, had to defend uh, uh, heterosexual marriage because that, it was the law of the land. But Martin Koshia, who was the Minister of Justice, he basically came to caucus and cabinet and said, look, you know, I'm tired, I'm sick and tired of supporting a, a, a law that just doesn't make sense. And he convinced us, you know, let's scrap it, let's go for same-sex marriage, and by golly, it happened. So um, there are many, there were many sides, you know, to this particular issue. But the fact that uh, that finally a persecuted minority were, were, was given this this new kind of right, something that the rest of us had just taken for granted, I mean, that was a that was a very sunny day in, in Canadian politics. What about the other side of, of your political career? When you, when you left that, that job in Ottawa, what did you feel uh, was your biggest disappointment? Uh, one was uh, our failure to uh, attack uh, the issues around uh, uh, First Nations. I mean, the First Nations, uh, you know, our Aboriginals, are still the poorest of the poor. They're the unhealthiest of the unhealthiest. Uh, they've been with us, you know, ever since the beginning of Canada, and there have been a lot of failures along the way. And we have got to do something because, uh, you know, they live far too many. Most of them, uh, you know, live in degradation. And it's, you know, they, they live on, you know, so many, they either live on reserves where they're there's very little hope for economic development. Or they live in cities like Regina and Saskatoon and Winnipeg, where again, they are, you know, they live in what you might call ghettos. I don't like the word, but they live in, in ghettos where again, the economic opportunities are not that great. And so it's been a disappointment. I, I think that we who are non-Aboriginal, we've got to take this issue much more seriously. And, uh, and I think that the more we provide opportunities for them, the more opportunities for the, for the rest of us, you know? You know that old expression, we're all better off when we're all better off? Well, it's true. And uh, I would like to see us uh, do a far better job and, uh, for Aboriginals, and I can tell you there's lots of room for it. Now, we're having this conversation in 2015, and I'm wondering what what concerns you about federal politics now? I think you feel there's a sense of unfinished business there. Tell me what, what you see with all the experience that you've had. Well, um, <clears throat> you mentioned unfinished business. I, I mentioned, of course, the unfinished, unfinished business around you know, Aboriginal issues. But I think what concerns me uh, about the way politics is conducted now Leslie, in this country, it is what I call over-professionalized, over-professionalized. In, in many ways, you asked earlier about, you know, what kind of power uh, the ordinary MP has. Trudeau, you know, senior, you know, said that MPs are nobody's, what, 50 yards off Parliament Hill. You might, you might say that they're nobody's right on the hill these days. And I think it's because MPs have made this terrible mistake of surrendering the power they did have, the little power they had, to professionals. Because now, you know, when you go to Ottawa, uh, Parliament Hill is swarming with all these, uh, Mike Duffy might say, you know, the, these people in sh sh short, short pants, right? And, um, um, and they're the ones who they're the ones who are making too many of the decisions. Because to them, you know, um, they don't go back door knocking these, these professional consultants. They're there to win. They're there to make their bosses look as good as possible. And of course, and to make their, their adversaries, their opponents as bad as possible. And, and so it's all about winning. It's, it's all about, um, in fact, you know, to these people, winning is the only thing. It's the only, only thing winning. And I, and I, think, uh, I think this is one of the reasons why we have seen uh, a change in the way 
uh, in the approach to, uh, to many issues. If, 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 if an issue really looks too ambitious, it, may, it might, uh, say, prompt a, a consideration of, uh, you know, raising taxes. You know, the professional will say, well, what do you want? You know, do you want to be re-elected or do you want to be defeated? So if you want to be defeated, go ahead and, and, and go for this particular issue. It may be good for the country, but you might get defeated. And so we have wound up, I think, in the last many years, playing what is called small ball politics. Like you take, for example, uh, just recently in the, in, the, in, the, in the 2015 election campaign, you know, the Prime Minister comes out with one of his, uh, one of the planks in his platform is a $150 tax credit for those who, uh, who buy a membership in a service club. Well, come on. I mean, is that what government is all about? Helping somebody who wants to be a member of Kiwanis or Lions or, you know, some other service club? I have, I, I have great uh, regard for people, you know, serving in a Kiwanis club or a Lions, but do they need a tax credit to be a member? <laughs> I, that to me is an extreme example uh, and a good example of small ball politics. I mean, let's have faith in government to do better things than that. Here we are, here we are concerned about, uh, say, the Canada Pension Plan. You know, the Canada Pension Plan, good for us, good for this country. It was started, what, back in the 60s, in the mid-60s. But, you know, countries change, issues change. I think uh, the Canada Pension Plan has to be buttressed. I think it has to be bolstered. It needs, it needs to be expanded. Uh, but no, that might cost an extra few dollars, so let's eschew that, let's avoid that, we, because that might cost us a few votes. What about pharmacare, for example? You know, we don't have a, we have a, what I consider a pretty darn good universal health care plan, but it doesn't include drugs, prescription drugs. And I think there are a lot of Canadians who, who want, you know, who want pharmacare, because, you know, prescription drugs are very expensive. I'll just give you, you know, I, I happen to be a, a cancer patient. One of my, you know, one of my uh, drugs, just one, costs $8,000 a month. $8,000 a month. Now, fortunately, it is paid for, you know, by, by government. But uh, so even the, but it's only because it's, it's almost like near an experimental drug. But a lot of drugs still cost a lot of money to, to the individual. But anyway, so, I mean, those are the big issues that should be tackled by government. But if you have lost faith in government, uh, and if you just want to do the little things, those jobs are never going to get done. I mean, why do you think, for example, um, uh, in many parts of the country, you know, the infrastructure is falling apart? We need bridges, we need roads, you know, we need aqueducts. There are all kinds of things that we need, but it's part of the, the, you know, the big picture and it costs money. And so we'd rather do the little things. Well, you have to do the little things, but you also have to do the big things. It, it takes, in democracies, you have to make sometimes very hard choices. You just can't always take the easy road. Thanks so much for our conversation today. I, we truly appreciate the effort that it represents. Oh, thank you. It's been a, it's a, been a joy talking to you. It's been a joy talking to someone who, who also has made a, a great name for herself in, in journalism. winner this year for Best Public Affairs Broadcaster in Television is John Harvard for 24 hours. <laughs>